The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, the photographer Edward Batinsky on the Russian invasion and his Ukrainian heritage. Plus, Winslow Homer's The Gulf Stream in depth and why the Russia-Ukraine war prompted the postponement of a Matisse show in China. Tom Seymour talks to Edward Batinsky in the week he was recognised for his outstanding contribution to his medium in the Sony World Photography Awards. In this episode's Work of the Week, we look at Winslow Homer's most famous work, The Gulf Stream, which is at the heart of a new show in New York. And I talk to Lisa Movius about the decision by the Nor regional government in France to suspend plans for Matisse by Matisse, a collaboration between the Musée Matisse Le Cateau Cambrécy and the private Beijing Museum UCCA over China's supposedly neutral position on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and whether other organisations may follow suit. Before all that, the latest series of our sister podcast, A Brush With, is now complete and features four more in-depth conversations with artists about their influences and cultural experiences. The latest episode is A Brush With, Nari Ward, ahead of his New York show opening this month. So subscribe wherever you get your podcasts to hear that and the other 40 conversations in the back catalogue. Do also subscribe to this podcast and give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, for more than 40 years, Edward Batinsky has worked as a landscape photographer, but his images on show now at Somerset House in London are not pristine pictures of untouched wilderness. Instead, they're documents of the colossal impact humanity has wrought on the planet at large, from mines and dams to factories and farms to rubbish heaps and slums. It's an emotional moment for Batinsky because his mother Mary and father Peter were born in Ukraine before eventually remaking their lives close to Toronto, where Edward was raised. Batinsky spoke to our associate editor, Tom Seymour, about his parents' experience of war and displacement, the influence they continue to exert on his work, and his hopes to one day photograph the rebuilding of Ukraine. Ebba Batinsky, your mother is 97. She lives in a retirement home outside of Toronto. And she grew up outside of Kiev in, in Ukraine. And she was witness as a child to the Soviet famine. And then at 17, her village was occupied by Nazi German soldiers and she was displaced basically taken to Germany and and worked on a farm essentially as a slave. Can you talk us through how those early experiences informed her later life in Canada as your mum and how she's reacted to the horror that's unfolded on our TV screens over the last few weeks? Yeah, so she came to Canada and she didn't speak the language. It took her almost four years after the war. Uh, She was in a displacement camp. And after the war, she managed to get uh, on a boat to Canada and went up into the north, into Kapiskasing. And life was hard up there and she had to learn the language. And eventually decided that she wanted to go somewhere where there's more opportunity. So she ended up going to St. Catharines where there was a GM town. They worked on the farms first and then my father got a job at GM in the early 50s. And then I was born in 1955. Uh, Ukrainian was my first language. And only when I was older did she start talking about her experience as a, as a young girl, seven and eight, and going through that great starvation in Ukraine where over 10 million people died through Stalin's crazy program of removing all the food from all the villages and then not bringing anything back and saying this was part of the collective and she remembers the collective to her is like this you know fearsome moment where even in her village she saw people starving to death and terrible things were happening there and she herself was a warrior for the freedom of Ukraine while it was under the Iron Curtain when she got here and she was a president of the Women's League for the freedom of Ukraine and would do bake sales and pierogi sales and all that and all the proceeds would go to Ukraine so she was really of course delighted when the USSR broke up up and now to see what's happening is just tragic and she actually you know recently told me that she wished she wasn't here to watch that she wished she would have passed earlier but she's just about to turn 98 and uh, I'm sad for her to have to see something that she worked and fought so hard for and 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 now her great nieces are in in, in danger of being killed by the Russians. Mm, I'm so sorry that she's experiencing that at such a late stage of her life. Let me ask about your father when you were a child he worked as a welder on your local GM plant near Toronto and was exposed, I think, to toxic PCBs, which contributed to his death. But he was a landscape painter in his spare time, right, outside of welding. And I think he gave you your first camera. 
just talk me through what he was like as a person and what his contribution to your career was at an early stage. Yeah, he actually came from the Carpathian Mountains, which was a very creative, artisanal town. And he was displaced when he was 17. And he actually was a young soldier in the uh, resistance against the Germans and then got captured by the Germans and then taken to the farms as well and put to work. But he always told me that you know creativity and painting and the whole town and his family was involved in painting and that creativity was something that was multi-generational. And that kind of business was in their family for, for centuries. It was interesting because I never had a chance to be there or see them. And I was going to go and see them in, in 2021, but the pandemic stopped that from happening. And I wanted to go to that town and meet other people with my last name and that kind of looked like me. And it was kind of, I thought that would be really interesting to do some portraits as well. But then, of course, that didn't happen. But my father painted. He was always creative. So I was always alongside him. He also came from Carpathian Mountains, and he loved nature. So I was always out in nature with him. He loved fishing. I, and so I l- learned a lot of things from him before he died and you know, fell in love with the natural world, going out in the forest, picking mushrooms, fishing, all of those types of things. And then, of course, painting. And I landscape painted alongside him. And then at 11, he, he got me a camera and a bulk loader. And so I can go and make all the pictures I wanted because I got filmed by 100-foot rolls. And I became the kid with the camera all the time. And I, I didn't like painting then because it took too much time away from being with my friends. But with a camera, I could run out and do things. And in one click of a button, I can have an image. So I almost had this intuitive, natural affinity to making images. And I never stopped. Yeah, beautiful memories. In a New Yorker profile in 2016, you told the reporter that Paul Klee, the painter, kept jumping out of the landscape while you were photographing, I think, an Indian salt plains from a helicopter. And when I look at your photography, I think you can speak about it in the legacy of, you know, cubism and, and Brock or Seurat's pointillism and divisionism or the abstract paintings you might associate with Kandinsky or Mondrian or abstract expressionism, Pollock or de Kooning. Like, this, this all, for me, plays a part in your photography. And do you look at artists beyond photography a lot still now after 40 years? Like, do you still gain inspiration from art more broadly? Absolutely, I do. And I I love looking at art. And to me, it it seems that I I like the certain kinds of forms of flattening of space, the all overness, the, the, you know, not too much of central images. I do them once in a while, but oftentimes they're very flattened images and and, uh, highly detailed. And I kind of like that. And to me, I've always allowed the kind of painterly references to surface when they made sense. Also, you know, with other photographers, Carlton Watkins was something of a marvel when I saw his beautiful prints that were 18 by 24 contact prints. And and the detail and the quality of them were unbelievable. And I remember going, oh, my God, 150 years later, photography can't beat that quality, can't beat the way he was uh, creating those images. So I was always kind of impressed by the, like the early photographers uh, and that kind of honesty with the subject matter. You just kind of confront it and you deal with it and you compose it. And that was also another motif that would run through my work. But again, you know, always kind of looking at photography as an extension of painting because, you know, obviously, you know, with the camera obscura, Painters started getting perspective and, and using the camera obscura to, to paint. And then the, the camera, when it fixed the image, took over from that point. And, and it's really interesting. And having started as a painter with my father and then going to camera, there was this kind of extension again to me to want to take that painting tradition into photography. When you accepted the Sony World Photography Award this week, you said in a statement, and I'll quote, in the face of fake news and Putin's vicious disinformation campaign, Ukrainian photographers are using this moment to show the world the truth. Their dedication to their art, even as their towns are surrounded by invading Russian forces bringing terror to their doorsteps, is a bravery that humbles me. Now, to me, this feels like a critical moment for Ukraine because just literally this week, we're beginning to see the invasion drop down the news agenda and people's attention is beginning to be drawn elsewhere. There was a terrorist attack in New York. Our prime minister is breaking the law. Given that, what can artists like yourself do to continue to aid your colleagues who are continuing to put their lives at risk to create great work from Ukraine? How can we support them as they try to keep this in the mind's eye? Well, I'm trying to do it. Uh, even last night, I, a couple of my collectors were at an event at the award ceremony. 
and I asked them if they would help me and support another photographer. So I'm supporting one photographer, and then I've got two more commitments to support them to really help them get a stipend while they're working so they don't have to worry about money. And, and I'm not going after the proper photojournalist. I'm going after artists with a camera like myself, but looking at it from a perspective where they're making images that will live on. They're not going to be consumables in a way. And I'm trying to help to get those images captured, and, and then using my social media, I'm going to try and put them out there as well and bring them forward to to newspapers and, and, and really help navigate those images into the media. Because I think images are shorthand today for keeping the story alive. You know, the words do one thing, but the pictures do so much more. And we, we use them so much to navigate what's happening in the world. So getting those pictures out of Ukraine and getting them into the world, I think, is the most important thing that we can be doing right now. You've spoken about your work before as documenting the rise of a predator species run amok, the predator species being us. And you've been creating work for roughly 40 years now. Do you think that the climate change movement that you advocate are reaching a broader audience now than ever before? I mean, are we changing people's perception of our relationship to nature and to the climate? I mean, I mean do you feel hopeful for the route we're on? I do. But I've also seen, like in 2007, I thought there was no way we're going back. Al Gore just came out with the inconvenient truth. The environment was on top of the agenda. And then, oh, wait, the market crash happened. And all of a sudden, it's number 10 in, in, in the priorities of things. The economy becomes number one, and, and then housing and everything else in the crash, and all the things that cascaded out of that. So I am afraid that when like even a war in Ukraine, you know, as terrible that is, but it does take away from this bigger issue. But I do think there's no going back now. I think in the last COP26, yes, they didn't achieve the things that they wanted. But at the same time, I, I think that governments are now doing it. They're now starting to move forward. Every corporation is now putting that into their corporate agenda. And I think individuals are really stepping up. So I think the danger is so close to our door now that there is no ignoring it. And the fires and the floods and the tornadoes. And yesterday I heard in middle America, they were getting hail the size of baseballs, you know, smashing the cars up and smashing through windows. So this is spooky weather. This is not normal weather. And if we're at the front end of this, the, the thin edge of that wedge, then, and it's going to get worse, then I think the cost of not doing something will far exceed the cost of doing something. And eventually, I think, you know, people are waking up to that. Absolutely. You've been a pioneer of augmented reality work beyond still photography. So at the National Gallery of Canada, in 2018, you showed a two-scale rendering of Sudan, who was the last male northern white rhinoceros who died earlier that year in March 2018. And you're currently working on In the Wake of Progress, which is a big, if I understand it correctly, augmented reality public exhibition. Do you want to talk us through what your plan is with In the Wake of Progress? And I'd like to get your take on the metaverse as a sort of overriding idea, which is getting a lot of attention and press right now. Is that something that you're going to be diving headlong into? Well, actually, the 3D renderings that I'm doing are augmented reality. And uh, and the way you do that is you have to capture a whole host of images, whether I'm doing an, I did an engine pile, but I also did Sudan. And you need you know, over a thousand images of that thing that you want to turn into augmented reality. So I've been working on that, and it's been very successful in, in exhibitions, and I continue to want to work with that. And in the wake of progress is this immersive 2D experience. It's not 3D, by the way. It's a 2D experience, but it's in the surround. It's three big screens that is looking at my whole career, the 40 years of my work, and taking you through an arc put to music that... I'm hoping can go out into the world and be seen far and wide. And I think what's interesting about it is it uses no words, but through the imagery and the music and the vocals that you come through that 20 minute experience and you really feel that something is happening in the world. We're changing in a way that is dangerous to us and to all other living things on the planet and biodiversity. And I'm trying to say it with imagery and with film imagery and still imagery that's taken throughout my career. And it's something that I was able to do throughout the pandemic. So it's a way to take that time and I couldn't do new shoots. So I said, how do I take that arc of work and turn it into something that's powerful that will move people? And I think if you move people emotionally from the heart, it then enters the mind in a whole other way and can be motivational to say, I'm going to change my life. I'm going to do something different. And that, I think, is really important that on an individual level, we start to accept that we are part of the problem and how can I change my own life in a way to make our world more sustainable to the future. 
You mentioned earlier that you were planning on going back to Ukraine and, and making some portraits and, and doing work there before the pandemic and then this horrendous war became part of our lives. Do you think you will return to Ukraine at some point? And if so, what kind of work do you envisage making there if you do make work there? Well, I do want to go back. And I think it's as soon as it stops being a hot war, and I hope that's soon and becomes the aftermath of the war, I would like to go there. And I've you know, made friends with several of the photographers who are working there now. And I'd, I'd like to go and actually, you know, for the record, you know, go and photograph what happened. You know, and I've never been a, a war photographer or a photographer of destruction. But in this case, because I'm Ukrainian and this has just occurred, I think it might be an opportunity to take the skills that I've learned and the, and, and the abilities I have as a photographer to go in there and make, again, these images that will live on in history of this particular event. And I'd love to turn it, that, and including the work of some of the photographers that I'm talking with right now in Ukraine and possibly do a book with the images and let that, that book live on in, in history as well. So I'm really wanting to try and do something that lays down some imagery for the future that tells the story of what's happening today. You've won an outstanding contribution to photography prize this week. I read that right at the start of your career, you had to work really, really hard to, to start make progress in photography. And I read that your, your mother, amongst other people, wasn't incredibly happy about the prospect of her son becoming an artist. You know, now you've won this prize. If I could bring that guy into this room now, who was just starting out, and he was propelled by his own determination, his own ambition, what would you say to him now? What would your message to him be, do you think? Well, I would say way to stick to your guns because there were so many times you know he he was willing to give up but never did and and uh, even at one point stopped for four years I think just before I turned 35 between 30 and 35 I almost didn't take many pictures I thought that's it I'm done and then I started up again so I, I would have said you know do what you did stick to it don't give up because again in the 80s you know I started in 82 there wasn't a market for large color work and that's what I was working in, large format color. And it wasn't until the mid-90s that my work started to sell. So for 15 years, I just made work with the earnings that I could make in other jobs. And uh, once in a while, I'd sell a print here and there, but it was mostly out of the love of making those images and going to tell a story about how we're reshaping the planet. And that was something that was, if I kept making these images, eventually the world would meet me somewhere halfway, that these images would mean something to the world. And I think... You know, that 20-something-year-old would be pretty happy about where it went, that the hunch was right back then. Well, yeah, thank God you didn't give up. And thank you personally for your contribution to photography. Ed Batinsky, really appreciate your time today, and thanks so much. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, Tom. You can see Edward Batinsky's work in the Sony World Photography Awards exhibition 2022 at Somerset House in London until the 2nd of May. Batinsky's multimedia project, In the Wake of Progress, has its premiere at the Luminato Festival in Toronto on the 11th and 12th of June. You can read the latest reports on the war in Ukraine and its effect on heritage and the art world at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android, which you can download from the App Store or Google Play. Coming up, Winslow home as the Gulf Stream and a Matisse show postponed due to China's position on the Russian invasion. But first, here are a few of the top stories on our website this week. The Greek collector Dimitris Daskalopoulos is donating more than 350 works from his vast contemporary art collection to four international museums in one of the largest ever philanthropic gifts. As Gareth Harris reports, the Greek National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens will receive 140 pieces, Tate gets 110 works, while the Guggenheim in New York and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago will assume joint ownership of around 100 works. Among the artists represented in the collection are Louise Bourgeois, Steve McQueen, Sarah Lucas and Kiki Smith. The collection gifts will also be accompanied by the creation of a network of curators, including a dedicated post at Tate and a new shared post at the Guggenheim and MCA Chicago. The nominees for the 2022 Turner Prize have been announced and include Veronica Ryan, who created the Hackney Windrush Commission in London, and Heather Philipson, whose fourth plinth commission in Trafalgar Square, a swirl of whipped cream topped with a drone, is still turning heads. The other nominees are British conceptual photographer Ingrid Pollard and Sin Wai Kin, formerly known as Victoria Sin. The prize returns this year to Tate Liverpool. The exhibition runs from the 20th of October to the 19th of March 2023, and the prize is awarded in December. 
Councillors in the Scottish city of Glasgow have agreed to return looted Indian, Nigerian and Native American artefacts. Among the items are Benin bronzes, a ceremonial sword from India and objects of the Lakota people in South Dakota in the US. The items were repatriated following recommendations from the Working Group for Repatriation and Spoliation of Artefacts, a cross-party body. Councillor David MacDonald, chairman of Glasgow Life, which manages the museums, described the move as a significant moment for the city and the wider debate on the topic of repatriation and decolonisation. You can read all these stories and more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This spring, Christie's presents 20th, 21st century Amsterdam, an exciting online auction bringing together works by post-war masters and contemporary names. Bidding is open from now until the 26th of April. Leading the sale are 26 works from the collection of the late John Hunov. Rich in breadth and wide in scope, each work bears witness to the collector's exceptional eye for detail, quality and artistic significance. A selection of highlights will be available to view at Christie's Amsterdam through the bidding period, by appointment only. Find out more about the sale and the exhibition at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, this episode's Work of the Week is one of the best-known paintings in American art. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York has just opened Winslow Homer Cross Currents and features more than 80 works by Homer, who's best known for his paintings of American life and scenery. But the Met Show looks at his work through the lens of conflict, a theme that spans his career. He documented the American Civil War of 1861-65, to for instance. But at the heart of the show is his most famous picture, the Gulf Stream, an image of a lone black man on a damaged boat on rough seas surrounded by sharks and it's this work that we're going to focus on. I spoke to the two organisers of the exhibition, Sylvia Yount, curator in charge of the American Wing at the Met and Stephanie Herdrich, the associate curator of American painting and sculpture at the museum, about the painting. Sylvia, he painted this in 1899. Where was he in terms of his career, his standing at that time? Homer was already very established at that point in his career at the turn of the 20th century. This painting is often seen as his most consequential and compelling to date. And yet it's a painting that he had been conceptualizing over 20 years before that. And in fact, the initial idea for this exhibition came about when Stephanie and I acquired for the collection this early sketch from 1885 that shows what seems to be two figures on a distressed and dismasted boat, and then continues to think through this theme. It comes out in different works. And then, as we know, he takes the painting back into his studio after its initial exhibition in Philadelphia. He's not as happy with it, often the case with Homer, responding to the critics, rethinking his compositions. And then he really uh, works on it for a few more years before it's exhibited again in 1906 and acquired by the Met at that time. Can you say more, Stephanie, about those journeys to the Caribbean that he made in the 1880s? Because obviously, as you say, they're very significant in terms of the gestation of this painting. Of course. So he first visits the Bahamas and Cuba in 1884-85. And like so many people at the time who visited there, at the beginning of a kind of wave of tourism to the islands, he's seeking warm weather, a healthful climate. His mother had died the previous year, so Homer and his father set sail from New York to Nassau in the Bahamas, and there he's just taken in by the gorgeous climate, the bright sunlight, the foliage, and, you know, it is a kind of holiday for him, but it really inspires him. A few years earlier, he's come back from England and made great strides in his work in watercolor, and this climate just inspires him to work with the medium in really new ways. But he's very much a privileged tourist, but he really starts exploring the island and looking at the lives of the inhabitants there and their work and their efforts and touching on post-slavery economies and geopolitical issues, you know, themes that will become very prominent across his career. And Sylvia, those subjects are obvious to us as people looking at these pictures in the 21st century but it's difficult isn't it to find specific comments by Homer about his intentions in depicting black people and particularly in describing the role of the black person who is on the boat in the Gulf Street is that right? 
That's right. And Homer is famously reticent throughout his career. And, you know, especially with the Gulf Stream, making it very clear that it's about the Gulf Stream, the actual Atlantic current, and not wanting to give anything else away in terms of the narrative. Though, of course, it's encouraged so many different types of readings, whether it is this grand statement about, you know, an existential comment on the human condition, a comment about his father, about race relations, which most historians see at this time as kind of reaching into deer. But I think if you look at the work, there is so much in that work dating from the 1860s near Andersonville, the famous painting, the only painting of a woman of color that he does at the time of the war, toward the end of the war, the extraordinary paintings during the Reconstruction period when he returns to Virginia, visit from the old mistress, the cotton pickers, dressing for carnival. There's so much emotion and meaning in those works. And I think if we trace that forward and see, as Stephanie said, what he's doing in the Bahamas, the kind of subjects he's drawn to, not just the touristic subjects. There's actually one in the show that we like to think is the most joyful, that extraordinary, very up close still life of oranges and the scent, the synesthetic experience that you get from looking at that extraordinary watercolor. But he is looking critically, I think, um, at these other types of social issues when he is in the Caribbean islands. And yes, he's not going to tell you exactly what he wants you to think or understand about the, the meaning of his works. He always rejected that. But nonetheless, Stephanie, he sets the tone by directly referring to the slave ship by Turner when referring to the Gulf Stream, right? That's a really crucial reference, isn't it? Exactly. Um, It's important for so many reasons. I mean, first, it demonstrates to us that Homer really is interested in his art historical legacy. And this is a painting of great ambition. And he frames it by comparing it to Turner's slave ship, a painting that the first Turner that's seen publicly in the United States, obviously one of Turner's most important, dramatic paintings. And Homer sees it in the early 1870s when it makes its debut in New York City. And in the late 1890s, it's found its way to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, so it's very much in the news. And Homer is comparing his painting, The Gulf Stream, to a painting that is about a terrible tragedy of the slave ship Zong, as it the captain of the ship threw overboard enslaved Africans to the sharks so he could collect insurance money. And this was a very famous case, a terrible tragedy, and Homer is referring to it in this work through his comments, but then also in the symbolism that he loads into the painting by emphasizing the subject as the Gulf Stream, by putting sugarcane prominently on the deck of the boat at the very center of the composition, the circling sharks, which also could be a reference to the Middle Passage. So it's all kind of poured into this painting of tremendous ambition. Going back to his reticence to discuss the subject. Is he fearful of people misjudging his position when he says that line, that quite funny line about not letting the public poke its nose into my picture? Is it less about shutting it down rather than being wary of them getting it wrong? I think he didn't want to reduce his works to one meaning, just as we're always encouraged today. We don't want to reduce art to meaning one thing only. And I think to Stephanie's point about this is his most ambitious, most consequential, most challenging subject to date. And he is very aware of it being a great statement of historical importance. I see it as a history painting. It's not only the reference to Turner. It's a reference to Jericho. It's a reference to the Raft of Medusa. We know he would have been familiar with John Singleton Copley's Great Watson and the Shark, a direct reference to that as well. So putting himself into a lineage. And these are themes, you know, of conflict and struggle and race, imperialism. I mean, he is thinking about these issues. These are very much a part of the public debate at this point in 1899, going through, obviously, the turn of the century, the U.S.'s rising role on the international stage, the fact that he is reminding us it's specifically about a specific place, the Gulf Stream. I think he is giving us clues to what the meaning is. But like most extraordinary, compelling artists, he doesn't want to reduce it to one thing. Yeah, I would add to, I mean, and yet we also know aesthetically, he wanted his paintings to be seen from far away. That was his ideal vantage point. So like everything with Homer, there are multiple meanings and ways of looking at it. And he even inscribes in the lower left of the Gulf Stream, correct, that this is best viewed from 12 feet away. Yeah, he says from 12 feet, you can see it. You know, we urge people obviously to come see the show if they can, but get up close and then step back 12 feet and see how it changes. (laughs) That's fascinating. You referenced that he made changes, Sylvia, but Stephanie, can you tell us a bit more about what he did 
to the painting after it had first been exhibited? And why did he do that? What was the significance? Because it seems to me to be very significant. Yes, yes. As Sylvia said, you know, he is very fussy about his works and making them just right. And when the painting was on view in its debut in 1899, before the show closes, he writes the Pennsylvania Academy and says, send it back to the studio. I want to paint on it some more. So between 99 and 1906, we know he works on it. Fabulously, we have a photo of the painting as it first appeared. And Homer makes changes to the deck of the boat, really amplifying the sense of distress. He shows some damage on the side of the boat. He adds a sail, a useless sail, drooping over the edge of the boat into the ocean. We know he changes the water. He amplifies the storm on the right horizon. But most significantly, he adds a boat, a possible source of rescue, on the horizon at the left. So it's really important to think about when the painting was first shown, there was no potential source of rescue and people inquired and were distressed and Homer writes this snappy kind of sarcastic letter saying, tell these school marms that the poor unfortunate man will be rescued by the passing ship and return to his family and live happily ever after. So this resentment at having to describe his pictures, he then kind of capitulates and adds this possible rescue boat on the horizon, and yet there's still so much tension. Our protagonist is looking away from the boat. We don't know if he sees it. We still don't know if he gets rescued. So Homer has given a kind of hopeful sign, but there's still no known outcome. It's it's up to us to speculate. And I think, in a way, the joke is sort of on us, right? The boat is there, but we still don't know what happens. And Homer wanted us to live in that place of discomfort and how fraught this situation is. I was intrigued to read in your essay, Stephanie, that there's a picture that's made sometime after this, a watercolour, in which a black figure is lying on a beach surrounded by shipwreck, yeah. and it's called After the Hurricane. And it's tempting to see that as the conclusion to the Gulf Stream. But even that isn't conclusive, is it? <laughs> Absolutely, right. In the series of works that he does in the Bahamas, you know, it's almost as if he's looking at the labor of these men. He looks at them going out to sea, returning from sea. He paints storms and hurricanes. And then this marvelous dynamic watercolor after the hurricane it shows this wrecked boat washed up on the beach and the man, you can't tell, is he unconscious? Is he dead? And again, Homer, it leaves it to us to speculate. And I think, you know, we'll never really know what Homer intended. And it's still left to speculation and unknown outcomes and ambiguity and um, challenging us. I wanted to explore the point that you make in your essay in the catalogue, Sylvia, that the life of the Gulf Stream continues today because it's still being interpreted by contemporary artists. Can you say something about that? Yeah, no, I mean, that's something that's fascinated Stephanie and me from the very beginning, that we keep finding those references, you know, over time. And I don't think we've actually located the first reference, but certainly in the last 20 years, uh, particularly artists of color have found that painting particularly compelling and have seen different things in it, have done their own reimaginings of it. And we were very pleased that we were able to pull together in a gallery that normally has the Gulf Stream on view in our American wing at the Met, a display of works by Kara Walker, Carrie James Marshall, and a younger artist of color named Hugh Hayden, who does his own riff on the Gulf Stream via Kerry James Marshall's riff on Homer. And it really raises just this, I think, the multiple interpretations, the different readings of those uncertain outcomes. And in Marshall's vision, this is not a scene of uh, black despair and trauma, but it's a scene of black joy. He's completely turned it into kind of a, a wonderful day of sailing on possibly the Caribbean, somewhere else with a, a series of black figures, very much at ease. But I think it definitely picks up on that notion of the black protagonist in Homer, who seems somewhat unperturbed. We don't really know what he's feeling, but in terms of the posture, there's a tenseness there, but there's also an incredible relaxation, looking away, kind of maybe he is accepting his fate, knowing that he has very little hope of surviving. But that has been fascinating to see, and we could have brought more artists together who have referenced that in complicated ways. And you're in London, you would recall, of course, the great Fonz Americanus that Kara Walker did in the Tate so two years ago now that has a specific reference, a three-dimensional foregrounded reference of the figure in the boat with the K-West on the boat and the sharks encircling. So I think it just, again, underlines the multiple meanings and interpretations one can bring to that really compelling painting. Lastly, I wanted to touch on one particularly compelling 
reference, which is Derek Walcott's extraordinary poem, Omeros, which includes a very specific description of this painting, but in this wonderful web of references that he connects to it. And of course, he does offer a very particular interpretation of the pose of the figure, doesn't he? Do you want to say more about that, Sylvia? Looking to Africa, looking to thinking about being caught between, and and to Stephanie's point, very much in the middle of this triangular trade, and looking to some kind of hope. And in fact, Hugh Hayden, his reading of his sketch for the Gulf Stream is also kind of imagining the figure in a new world, as he says, kind of at comfort, at home, and rescued. I find it so extraordinarily moving, right? The impact of this painting and the just poetic and inspired ways that artists have responded to it. And it really, I think, speaks to the power of Homer as an artist and this tension and ambiguity that he left with us, that it allows us to interpret it and reinterpret it and remix it in so many ways. And that's really a powerful part of Homer's legacy. Well, Sylvia and Stephanie, thank you both very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much. Winslow Homer Cross Currents is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York until the 31st of July. It travels to the National Gallery in London, where it's titled Force of Nature, between 10th of September and the 8th of January 2023. And finally, the first museum exhibition featuring the work of Henri Matisse in mainland China was due to open in Beijing in March. Matisse by Matisse was a long-planned show of more than 250 works from the Matisse Museum in the northern French town of Le Cateau Cambrécy and would have opened at the private Beijing Museum, UCCA. But the regional government in France's Nord Department suspended plans for the show at the 11th hour because of China's tenuous neutrality following the invasion of Ukraine. So, is this an isolated postponement or the start of a wider cultural boycott of China in relation to the war. I spoke to Lisa Movius, the art newspaper's correspondent in Shanghai, which is currently in a strict COVID-19 lockdown, about the story. Lisa, in your article about the situation regarding Chinese museums and Russia, you say that there's been outspoken support for Ukraine among the Chinese art world. Could you expand on that a little? Well, in China, there is, of course, a lot of limitations on the way you can speak out. So it primarily happens on Chinese social media, Weixin and Weibo. Weixin is like the chat message app, which also has a moments function where you can post articles and pictures and commentary. And then Weibo is like Chinese Twitter. So those have gone largely uncensored. Amongst the art world, people have been posting articles about what's happening in Ukraine, contrary to the official semi-pro-Russian narrative in the Chinese state media, as well as, say, just posting blue and yellow color schemes, for example, as a way to make quiet commentary. But you know, you cannot have any kind of like protests or official statements like you might have in freer countries. So basically, museums can't show solidarity, as we're seeing lots of cultural organisations are in the West, they're sort of, you know, put it, as you say, the flags and then a statement. You're not seeing that on museum websites, for instance. No, definitely not. This is much more happening at an individual level. I think if it happened at an institutional level, that would probably encounter some challenges. Indeed. Okay. so and also just in terms of those social media platforms you're talking about, can those be censored or do they tend to go under the radar of the state to a certain degree? They get censored. They get very heavily censored. And so it often says quite a lot of what doesn't get censored. And so when things continue to be posted on Weibo or Weixin on a regular basis, it shows that there's a little more latitude in terms of official policy. But there has been some resistance to certain arts figures speaking out, has there not? One particular, was it a theatre director who who said something? That, that, that No, she's a famous choreographer and celebrity and dancer called Jin Xing, who on her Weibo called Putin a madman. And that was a little bit too far for what the government will put up with. But she just had her account suspended. I'm not sure if it's been reinstated since then. So it depends on how high profile you are, as well as how aggressive your statement is. Right. Um, Let's talk about this Matisse show then. It was going to be at UCCA, Mm. which is one of the most prominent museums and galleries in China. Mm -hmm. But what's happened? So about three weeks before the show was supposed to open, the Nord Department, which is a provincial government in France, announced that it was canceling but hopefully postponing the show because of concerns over China's diplomatic support for Russia. 
and it expressed concern about the safety of the works as well as being able to recover them, which is a little bit odd because UCCA is, first of all, a private museum, and so they don't really have any involvement in state policy. Secondly, they've also been able over the years to hold really high-profile loan shows like the Picasso show a few years ago. So they have a track record of handling uh, international and especially French antiquities. It seems like it's very much a local government decision that's not so informed by national or French policy. That's interesting. And, and, and also, obviously, this was quite a hyped show, wasn't it? I remember when we were looking at the sort of year ahead in the art newspaper, we picked up on this show. The museum was making a big fuss about it. It was much anticipated. There's obviously been quite a lot of interest, hasn't there, in shows like the one you talked about, the Picasso show, and indeed shows of that kind of modern and impressionist art that have come to China. Of course, because for most Chinese audiences, they've never seen these works in person before. And if most, it's maybe been one or two in a group show. So it's very exciting for the average Chinese art goer who can't afford to go do a grand tour of Europe or of the US to be able to see these kind of shows in person. And even for art world figures who can travel a lot more, it's still really nice to be able to go and see these in their hometown. So it's very important. It's very influential to have these shows coming through China. And really, you know, it has been establishing over the last, you know, 10 years, 30 years, these kind of cultural dialogue that's very valuable. And has this gone beyond this particular incident? Or is it is it very much isolated to this particular show? It's completely isolated. This is the only one. Can you tell us what people are saying? For instance, what are UCCA saying and the organisers of this? Because I believe that this is one of a number of projects that are curated by a kind of curatorial organisation rather than just simply UCCA, right? Right, right. So UCCA declined to comment because they're still trying to negotiate the exhibition going ahead in the future. And presumably they hope that the dust will settle and they'll still be able to get the show to go on. We spoke for the article to the co-founders of this organization called The Doors, which was founded by two French women who have lived in China and been involved in the arts for many decades. And they have an active roster of exhibitions coming primarily from France to tour in China. And so all of their other projects have been going ahead unaffected by the situation in Ukraine. And of course, projects in Europe are very impacted. But here in China, this was the only only one. Are they at all concerned that it will have a broader effect? Or do they recognise that it's very much about a local government as opposed to national government situation? Their attitude was that this was an isolated event and a bit of a local political misunderstanding of the broader geopolitical standpoint that you know China is trying to play both sides and have it every way here without getting too involved in things. And the French government itself, the national government, has continued to be very active in promoting cultural activities here, as have many European governments. How specific has Nord been about the reasons for pulling the show? They just issued a simple statement at the time that was fairly vague. They said it was not punitive, although, of course, it felt a little bit punitive. And that it seems like just a concern of their reacting to maybe local politics rather than the real situation between uh, China and France and Russia and the world. Right. And of course, it's it's curious, isn't it? Because one of the things that we've been focusing on a little bit of the art newspaper is the wider ethical concerns about China, and particularly about the Uyghurs, and the fact that, for instance, the US government declared that what's happening in Xinjiang as, as a genocide, and there was this tribunal in London, which also declared it a genocide. Mm-hmm. And as far as I can tell, there was no cultural boycott of any kind or any kind of cultural ramifications from those declarations, right? Right, because cultural boycotts hurt the people. They don't hurt the people making the policies in a country like China. So any kind of cultural boycott, especially against a municipal level government or against a private museum, it's going to hurt those institutions. It's going to hurt their audiences, but it's not going to hurt the people in the national government who are making these kind of policy decisions. Right. So in terms of cultural relations, government organisations like the British Council, sort of soft power, and also in terms of museums like the Tate and the V&A, it's business as usual, as, as far as you understand it, is it? 
Yeah, it seems to have been continuing as much as usual as possible, given the challenges to shipping and especially the COVID situation here. So soft power is soft power because it's about reaching hearts and minds. It's about engaging with people. It's about humanizing each other and having conversations and having greater understanding of each other. And so penalizing those in the names of penalizing the central government is, if anything, counterproductive. Unfortunately, it's much harder to talk about, say, don't sell artworks to people whose families are in the central government, because it's very hush-hush about who is related to whom within Beijing and the power structures. But of course, there is a lot of that going on, and that's probably where the energy should be directed, but it's also very hard to extricate those connections. From your position in China, do you think that the Chinese government is sensitive to how it is perceived in relation to Russia? Oh, definitely. It definitely is trying to walk this very thin and delicate balance. It doesn't want Russia to be strong, but it doesn't want America to be strong either. It sees itself as a sort of third party in a uh, tripolar world that's coming together. So traditionally, China has had as bad relations with Russia as it has with America and the West. So these are not exactly, you know, tight alliances. These are relationships of convenience. Okay, well, while you're on the line, I wanted to ask you about Shanghai, because here in London, where I am, and across Europe and North America, for instance, there's people talking about the end of the pandemic. Lots of us don't feel it is the end of the pandemic, but there is this idea of now living with COVID. China's very different, isn't it? And particularly Shanghai. So tell us what's going on where you are. Well, so Shanghai is in day 12 of a citywide strict lockdown. This is as strict as happened in Italy and in Wuhan in 2020. So most of us cannot even leave our apartments except to go out and get tested. My building has had zero cases, so we're allowed to move within the building and go into the parking lot, but that's as far as we can go for a few more days. Most of the city can't go out at all, so only 20% are as free to go as we are. China, since 2020, has been pursuing, as you say, this zero COVID policy. It's really been such a study of extremes. Like the West has just done next to nothing to combat COVID, apart from these very, very, very soft lockdowns. And yet people complain so much about those. Whereas here we've had lockdowns as soon as there's one or two cases, but those were also fairly soft lockdowns compared to what we're going through now. So, you know, public spaces, maybe museums closed down, but like galleries keep opening, that sort of middle ground. Shanghai has never had a hard lockdown like this before. In 2020, most things were closed, but we could still move around pretty easily. We could still get food delivery. And then in March, we had a sort of medium soft lockdown where we were in our buildings for seven days, but we could go out to get groceries and we could still get food delivery. This one is pretty draconian. The policy is controversial, but it's the same logic of lockdowns everywhere that you just freeze it out. However, cases keep climbing because of bad management, because like volunteers seem to be spreading it to the population, because people keep catching them at the testing, because they come out of the apartments, get together in their neighborhoods and test, and that seems to be spreading it. And that's one problem. The other problem is that the long-term ramifications of how it's handled, instead of letting people quarantine at home, even asymptomatic cases are getting dragged to these quite horrific quarantine camps. The biggest one is 60,000 people. Most of them are only a couple thousand, but they're worse than prisons. There are these huge mass areas where there's no showers, there's few toilets, the food conditions are very bad, there's no privacy. It's a place you go to get sicker, not a place you go to recover. Sounds terrible. And as you say, how are you getting food? (laughs) So actually, this has been the really adorable side of the pandemic is that with food delivery shut down, you know, we're very spoiled in Shanghai. We have amazing food delivery. You can get almost any food any hour of the day within like 30 minutes for not very much money. It's actually really tough on young people who don't know how to cook because you hand them a pile of vegetables and they don't know what to do with it. But the overwhelming majority of the affluent, well-connected Shanghai population has been banding together in our buildings to group buy food. It's like, oh, my kid doesn't like cucumbers. Who wants them? I'll trade them for an onion. Like the bartering system is getting portrayed as some kind of desperate thing, but it's actually like this really cute neighborly, you know, who, who has too much and who has too little. When we were still locked in our apartments, One of my neighbors sent a pineapple up the elevator. So she texted me. I've never met this person, but she had an extra pineapple. She's like, I put the pineapple in the elevator. Go press your button and it'll come to you. And it did. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, so it, it sounds like you're putting a brave face on some pretty terrible conditions. As you say, the art world is effectively closed down for the moment. Right, right? Do you right. mean even private galleries which stayed open, didn't they, in other lockdowns are, are closed and everything? There's no activity correct, in Shanghai correct. right now. Correct, Everything is closed down. So by and large, the art world, including myself, are in comfortable buildings. We're downtown. We have resources. So yes, people are going hungry. If they are poor, if they are like workers who are stuck in dormitories, college students have been stuck in dormitories for like 40 days now. It's pretty bad. They have food. They're safe, but it's really unhappy. Also, the elderly who don't know how to use food ordering apps have it really difficult. And of course, there's one privileged population that's having a very hard time, which is expats who don't speak Chinese because they don't know how to like order food with their neighbors because you have to order like 100 boxes of food at a time to get it delivered. So they actually have it pretty tough. And of course, anyone who's going to the quarantine camps have it pretty miserable. And that whole policy is very unpopular. And people are very angry about that. The other problems have been for the first few days, they were taking kids away from their parents because they had separate quarantine facilities for children. And there was such an outcry against that, that they've relaxed that policy. Okay, well, Lisa, stay well and stay safe, and I hope things ease for you in the coming days. Okay, thank you, Ben. You can read Lisa Mobius' story on China and Russia on the website or the app. And that's all for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Julia Mahalska, Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentel and David Clack. David is also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to this week's guests, Tom and Edward, Sylvia and Stephanie and Lisa. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.